I'm pretty excited today. Every week I get numerous calls for Airbnbs in Miami. Today I'm honored. I have a friend. His name is Andy Newman, Newman Hospitality, one of the best short-term rental management companies in South Florida. If you don't believe me, check the reviews. But more than anything, check out our video. You're gonna love it. I stayed in a brownstone in New York and the guy who rented from me had rented four brownstones in the same building. So by day, he worked in computers at Columbia University and by night he would come and clean and, oh, wow. and do all this. And he was making more money with that business than he was at Columbia University. So that's when I said, wow, this, this is interesting. It's early on. And I shocked my, uh, my assistant when I told her, well, we're gonna start doing an Airbnb business. So Andy, I'm getting more and more people calling me from all around the country. They're moving to Miami, as you know, and they want to get an Airbnb. Since I'm not the expert, that's why you're here today. Um, as far as Airbnbs, before we get into all the questions, I want to ask you, what are some of the things that people think with Airbnbs are reality and they're the opposite? It's not reality. People think that it is a, an easy and a sure business, that it's a sure bet. And, um, and that's what's not reality. It's, it's a pretty complex business. It's, uh, an Airbnb is essentially like having your own hotel. And uh, you can potentially be called at any time to resolve any issues. And, uh, and people sometimes forget that it's not a real hotel, but they expect the service of a hotel. I have a problem and how quickly can you resolve it? And by the way, don't fix it while I'm here, but fix it. So you got to juggle those things and do it during difficult times like, like COVID. So that's, so process wise, it, it can get complex. Now, when you're starting with just one, it's, it's a lot easier to, to manage one. And, and often it's one that you might know, but, uh, the business is more difficult than, uh, than what it appears to, to many people initially. So yeah, I'm sure it's a lot more difficult like anything in life, right? Um, when someone is getting started, um, as far as insurance, what do they need to do to have an Airbnb? The insurance topic is, is delicate. Your, your key thing is liability insurance. So you have your basic home insurance and, and some home insurance companies will not insure you if you're doing an Airbnb. So you can continue to do Airbnb and choose not to notify your insurance company. You do have coverage from Airbnb. Airbnb has two good programs. It has a host protection program. Host would be the owner and a guest protection program. And you're protected a million dollars damages and liabilities. So, so that typically will cover you so that you don't need to go to your home insurance company. Now, you can also have your guests purchase additional, uh, and it's not very expensive, 50 to $100 additional property damage protection insurance. We, we do that as well to cover, let's say, damage to furniture, damage to, to something in the house. So it's sort of like a rental car policy when someone rents a car and then they have an additional policy? Correct. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. Okay, and so you mentioned that um, Airbnb will give you this insurance, I think up to a million dollars. Right. What is the cost for that? There is no cost. There is no cost. It's part of the, uh, of the service that Airbnb gives you. I think they realized after a while that people, that in order to get more homeowners, they needed to give them more protection. And okay. uh, Airbnb has steadily over the years, uh, they have been added, adding more protection. Okay, and as you talk about Airbnb, I've been watching TV a lot lately and they keep having Verbo. And is there a difference between Verbo or VRBO and Airbnb? There is a difference. All of them are called OTAs, online travel agents. So you have the Verbo, the Airbnb, Booking, Expedia. The big ones by far are Airbnb and Verbo. And, and Airbnb now runs the culture and is the dominant player in the sector. However, Verbo was first, was the first one here. And, and Verbo was really started, I think in the early 2000s. And they originally started as, as, a, as, a, as something for the owners. 
as a platform for the owners to be able to market their property, not for um, professional hosts. And uh, now what has happened is that Verbo is, is probably more entrenched in vacation areas. Let's say Cape Cod on one end, uh, Vail and Aspen. Verbo is strong there. Airbnb has been very strong in the urban areas. Verbo has been stronger with the uh, older uh, baby boomer. Airbnb has been stronger with the Gen Z and Gen Ys. So um, yeah, and, and again in the urban market. Yeah, it's funny um, when you say that as far as they, they um, I guess different people looking at different ones. Mm -hmm. And when I see the Verbo commercials, it seems like more higher end, more experiential, like these family reunions, these get togethers, probably more expensive um, short term rentals than Airbnb. I, I, I haven't seen that many Airbnb ads, but I haven't seen them promote that same thing. Is that the yeah, case? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Verbo tends to be in the higher end homes. And very often, these vacation communities, very often the managers only work with Verbo. Um, so, so yeah, Verbo really does work more in the vacation management area and, and the higher end homes. And a big, big difference. Verbo has never gone into the, the rent a room in your home. Verbo is a whole home experience. In fact, they had, I think, some famous commercial, commercials mocking Airbnb where you would go in and you have to share the home and, and how uncomfortable you would be. So, uh, yeah, I think Verbo has really uh, branded on a whole home experience. Nice. So going back into, say, I'm buying a short-term rental. It's funny how we, we brand a short-term rental as an Airbnb, like yeah. Kleenex with tissues and stuff like that. So say I'm buying it, mm -hmm. buying one. I have all these ideas in my head that may not be accurate. If I'm starting fresh and say I'm a family member and you're, you're mm -hmm. teaching me the ropes, right. what, what are some of the things that you would tell me to do? Say I, the first step is I'm looking at a home. What would you tell me when I'm looking for a home, what I should do? Okay, I would first tell you to look for areas that are friendly to short-term rentals. That, that is absolutely key. Unfortunately, we have a lot of enemies. It can be either an HOA, it can be a community. So you want to go into an area where, where you think you're not going to have any issues. Uh, whether it's designed for short-term rentals or if there's no HOA. So for example, I'm in Naples. Naples is very, very high end and a lot of these gated communities are very hard to operate in. On the other hand, I work in a very regular Naples neighborhood that has been around since the 70s. No gate, no HOA. I become friendly with my neighbors. And that's the other thing. You want to you want to not ignore your neighbors. You want to get to know them. You want to maybe find out how would you feel if I run an Airbnb? Because you want to know beforehand if you're going to have a, a friend or an enemy. Because right. if it's an enemy, they can really, really make your business difficult. So I would really look at that. That's a very hot potato in our space is, is the whole regulatory aspect. And, and as much as guests don't realize it because they're using Airbnb more and more, investors and people that want to go into the space should be very aware of all of these nuances, regulations before they step in. Is there an easy answer to share with um, the viewers how they can do that? How they can figure out what is, what is, where they can do a short-term rental or not? I know it's a pretty complex question, but what, where would they look for that? Yeah, I wish there was. And you know, if somebody did that, they could probably make a lot of money creating a service <laughs> that did that because I, I haven't seen one yet. I haven't seen one yet. Um, you can go online. You can go, for example, famous South Beach. It's an epicenter hotspot in the positive and the negative. Uh, there's a lot of places in South Beach that are not permitted to Airbnb where you have huge fines. Now you can come up with a map. There's maps out there that literally have a red color on the areas that are quote unquote forbidden. But yes, you can. You can go to the county. Now, the, the, the tendency has been many areas to regulate, which is positive because where it's regulated, you know what the rules are and you know that, that what you need to do. You know how you get, need to get licensed. You know the cost. There is a cost to it. There's a 
initiating cost, and then there's an ongoing cost. So for example, here we have uh, certified extinguishers. We have uh, a number of things that, that we need to do. Some places will even require a phone line. So the cities will tell you that. The city will, will definitely tell you that. And some cities are ambiguous. Miami is ambiguous. It's a yes, no. Um, well, we don't certify a home, but there's thousands of homes. <laughs> and right. Miami won't touch you unless you really run a bad operation and parties are taking place and you're getting constant complaints from neighbors. So, um, so there's those two extremes. Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale regulated a while ago and it's very clear exactly what, what you need to do. And if you don't respect the rules, if you operate without a license, they'll catch you and quickly. Right. Because they have these, these compliance companies now <laughs> that, that literally are specialized in, in, in canvassing the area and knowing who started and they immediately inform the city. So you would be amazed how quickly. Key advice, if it's not allowed, don't do it. Now, I started early on in this business, sort of a pioneer. So we broke ground and we did it whether it was allowed or not in the building or not in the building. Right. This day and age, we're more mature and, and we don't go into places that are not allowed because it's just too, too complicated and who, it's difficult enough to start a business, right. to have to start one with a fight. <laughs> totally. So like you spoke about Miami-Dade and how ambiguous they are with certain things. If someone wanted to do it the right way, would they go to the county or where would they go to get sort of the answers to the questions? Well, some parts of, of day do have regulations, but, but Miami itself, or for example, supposedly in Coral Gables, you cannot Airbnb. Now, if you go into Airbnb, you see a lot of, uh, a lot of Airbnbs operating. I wouldn't try it there. Uh, maybe they're very lenient. Maybe they're like Miami. They may not do anything until there's a problem. But uh, we've operated very successfully in Coconut Grove. And again, in, in Miami itself, there's not, you can call and they will just be ambiguous. <laughs> so that, is that Miami-Dade County or just Miami? I would say that's Miami, not okay, Dade but, County. But that's for Miami-Dade Miami. County? For Dade County, yes. You can go to each individual city okay. and, and they will have their rules. For example, Golden, uh, Golden Beach, Okay. very exclusive. Right, right. Golden Beach, you can... <laughs> You can do Airbnb, I think, two or three or four times a year. Uh, wow. Don't quote me. Right, uh, right, right. They have these very uh, strict parameters. How well do they enforce it? I don't know. But do be aware that in these highly sensitive communities, every neighbor becomes an enforcer. Totally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. Um, so if someone, so for example, say it's Pinecrest or wherever it is in Miami, someone wants to do Airbnbs the right way, they... Who do they go to in that city? Who would they ask for? They would, I'll have to get back to you exactly who they would ask for. I have somebody in my company, literally, that focuses a big portion of his time on registrations. That's how important and how time consuming that is. Right. We, we offshore certain, certain things and I was looking to lower costs. Can we offshore this whole registration process? And it's when, just when my different. colleague showed me how involved and how complex it is to fill out these forms, we realized we needed to keep it here. So I'll get back to you on, on, on who precisely they, they would call. Okay, so I guess a better question would be, where in Miami do people do it where you know it's, it's they can do it. Yeah. The Grove, you can definitely do it. Brickle, you can do it. Now, you got to be careful. It's not just Miami. It's also the bigger problem in the city is the HOA, the condo association, the building. That's bigger. So almost always, if there's a gated community, they will not allow short-term okay. rentals. Now, there are some smart gated communities. <laughs> that allow it. <laughs> Very smart. Yeah. That, because in reality, if you manage it, you can take away some of the, let's call them inconveniences for the owners of a short-term rental without, without really limiting the ownership privileges of being able to monetize your property as you see fit. So we work in Naples in, in one community that is gated, very nice, very high-end with lots of amenities, and they allow short-term rentals as long as it's a minimum of a week. And you know what? 
it is a restriction. It can reduce revenues a little bit, but we can live with that one. We can definitely live with that one, especially in a market like Naples. I would think so, that would probably raise the prices of the properties, right? If, if you have an area where they allow it and you can make income, it's probably going to... Absolutely. Absolutely. Early on, I saw the two Icon Towers in Miami. One allows Airbnb, the other one didn't. And one had a 30% uh, vacancy rate. I mean, the units that were right. not sold, the other one was full and the units were selling for a higher price. Wow. You know? That's amazing. <laughs> okay. So, so we buy the house, we're ready to, to do the Airbnb. What's the next step? Very important. Yes. Staging. Very important. We really put a lot of attention to every item that you put in the house. You want to have, you want to have a house, you want to navigate that spectrum between giving a house character and culture without going to the extreme of overwhelming your, your guest and, and not allowing them to take possession of the house. So sometimes if a house, let's say it is a lived in home, that's where you have that risk because the owners have all their precious belongings there that to them is precious, but to somebody who's there for a week or 10 days, where they don't have room to put even their keys on a table because it's so full of things. So you have to, you have to furnish it in a way that, that has taste. Uh, again, because you have a lot of people that think, Oh, let me go to a thrift shop and, and buy things. Well, your Airbnb will, your short term rental will look like a thrift shop. <laughs> right, right. If that's what you do. Right, and, right. And, and in reality, people, you will not attract the same level of guests. You will not attract people that will want to stay longer. You will not attract people that want to come back. So one of the best returns on your investment, and that's one of the big mistakes. People will say to me, but Andy, the worst investment is furniture. You buy them and two minutes later, they're worthless. That's a bad way of looking at it because what point is it to buy cheap furniture? If then you get forever a terrible return, mediocre reviews. If you spend instead of 10,000, you spend 20,000 in furniture. Well, maybe that extra 10,000 could be getting you an extra 10,000 in revenue. So you have a hundred percent return on that $10,000 of investment. I would say that's a good return on investment. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like staging a home when you're selling it, right? Absolutely. It's the same thing like staging your home. What do you know? It'll sell faster, much faster. You know, when the market was normal, I know people that staged and, and, and homes that hadn't sold for 12 to 18 months were staged and were sold within 10 days. Yeah. Our teams, we stage a lot of homes. We have one stage right now and it makes a huge difference. So with that furniture, the quality, you probably another thing that they probably have to think about is like how strong the furniture is, right? Yeah, that is that's a really good point. We've made that mistake that we'll we'll buy a, a sleeper couch and 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 yeah, when it's not quality, first of all, it's not comfortable. Second of all, it breaks and quickly. So uh, I've bought expensive furniture that is broken, but when you buy expensive furniture at a good shop, we often buy a, a warranty and it's covered. Right. And it's covered or insurance pays for it. But you want to buy, yeah, you do want to buy durable furniture, furniture that feels solid. And, uh, and now you don't have to go crazy with brands. I learned one key thing. You need to give people two things. When they come into the house, it needs to be impeccable. It needs to be clean. If it's clean, then little things can happen and typically they'll forgive you and they'll work with you. But if it's not clean and anything happens, they're not going to be very forgiving. You're already swimming against the current. Give them a clean home. Number two, give them a comfortable bed to sleep in. What beds would you recommend? You know what? I use a mattress consultant. Oh, wow. Well, I okay. do. In, so you're in, really, in, yeah. In coconut Grove, I went from <laughs> buying in Amazon. I couldn't care less mattress. Who needs a mattress? $200. That's fine. More right. than enough. Right. Right. And then I started getting complaints and, and I started to evolve and I started to learn that, wait a moment, we need to give people a hotel quality bed sleeping experience, which means comfortable box spring. None of this flimsy wayfair, Right. you know, uh, little slabs that will, that will fall apart right, right. relatively quickly. 
And by the way, if you buy a bad frame and a good mattress, you're not protecting the good mattress. Right. right. So it's not going to last very long. Again, you don't need to go crazy and pay Casper for their 90, for their, you know, 90% of cost in marketing, right? Right, right. You're paying for totally. all that television time. Totally. There are a lot of great companies that make a solid, comfortable mattress. It doesn't have to be, like I said, the brands you see in television, but that's why I use a mattress consultant. And uh, so you either get a box spring or at the very least a bunky board to give it that. What's a bunky board? A bunky board goes under, goes above the frame and under the mattress. Okay. So that the mattress can't be stuck in between those slabs and slowly your mattress starts doing a right, little bit right. of this. Okay. A good mattress cover and good linen, good towels, good, and you got to keep them fresh. So that's why I tell my owners there's a linen fee because I will replace them as needed. Things happen, they either disappear, they get stained, they get soiled, and, and, and you, you have to replace them. If you give that feeling of plushness in the linens and towels, you can't imagine how far that goes. And, and it's not that much more money. Again, that's one of those places that's a great return on investment. What are some bad returns on investment? Yeah, you know, spending on a $3,000 designer chair. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Right. So that someone can put their dirty foot on it and you're stressed, right. you know, all over. I mean, yeah, over overspending. So there is, there is a curve where, where you maximize and then maybe it's over the top too, too much. Um, and, and maybe it's not congruent. So let's say, yeah, you have an amazing $4 million home. Well, maybe the $3,000 chair is appropriate in that home. But if you have a plain vanilla $700,000 home and you have a $3,000 chair, each chair, right. well, it's not, it's not congruent and maybe those guests might not really appreciate it. But I had a client that couldn't sell a house on Fort Lauderdale on the canal. It was about two and a half million before COVID, probably three and a half now. And he had amazing furniture. He had really, really nice furniture. Well, the people that came into that house, Didn't he left care. the same furniture. Well, they, actually, they, it was, we were charging a lot of money for that house, so they, they were very high end and they appreciated that it was mm. really good furniture right, right. In, in that particular case. So I would say things have to have a certain sense of balance. Right. It's the clients you're, I guess you're marketing to, right? Yeah. The it's ones the you're clients trying to get. you're marketing. Okay. And so with that said, um, furniture and all that, if someone is buying, so say, I just want people to get an idea of costs, mm -hmm. right? Right. So you buy, what would you say an average, not a condo, but like a single family home that, that someone rents, that does short term rentals and say Dade or Broward County, what would be that type of home? Like three bedroom, two okay. bath? Or That's what? an excellent question. And that has changed. That has definitely changed post COVID. Okay. Here's what I tell people, buy more bedrooms than you think always. And Always, if you have to choose between square footage, choose bedrooms. So even if the bedrooms are smaller, caveat to that, they can be small, but you need to fit that big bed. People like big beds. So when you say a big bed, is that a queen, a king? It's or? at least a queen. Okay. One of the rooms should have a king if we can, but we can survive on queens. You will lose, you will lose reservations for beds that are not big enough. You will lose reservations for not having enough rooms. You will not lose that many reservations for having too many rooms. Think about what has happened in the transformation in travel and the transformation in our industry. What we have now is we have a more nomadic population. We have a population that has been unshackled from the office and they can live and spend considerable amount of time in, in different places right. and it's happening. I was riding on the lift in Taos Ski Valley and there was a young gentleman in his early 30s. I asked him what he was doing. Oh, I'm airbnb for a year is exactly what he said. Stays on average between two weeks and a month. What was he renting? With his partner, he was renting a two bedroom. Why? Because you need the room work and you need the work and he wants to work. He needs his workspace, space, she needs her workspace. So, and you can even take that further. The higher end client also wants 
their buddies are also nomads, <laughs> right? Right, right? So they want them to know, hey, we're in Austin today, they posted in Instagram. Right. Who is in Austin? Who wants to come to Austin? We're going to be there for two weeks. Friends will show up. My son rented a house in Taos and he rented it for a month and a half, ski season, and he posted it and he had at least four or five groups of friends that spent about 10 days. They came oh, wow. in and they left. Next group came in and left. They all have certain needs. So rooms, more rooms are, are better. That's, that's a key, that, that was, I would say that is a key component. What about like bathrooms? Bathrooms are also, um, I've been surprised. I've rented at very high rates in Naples, which is very high end. And I have a, a house that I've rented that's a 4-2. And I was a little bit insecure thinking, man, these high end people from Chicago and Toronto, are they gonna have trouble with only two bathrooms? But it, it, it rented, however, if you ask me to choose, if I start from scratch, put a bathroom in every room. Okay. Absolutely. An ensuite bathroom in every room. It just brings in the higher end guests. It makes it more private. You can charge more money. It's like having a pool and not having a pool. You're rented without a pool for much less money. More bathrooms, more money for sure. So bathrooms, kitchen. You don't, you know, make a kitchen that's very functional. So if, you're, if you have to design a space from the ground up, what don't you do? You don't need walk-in closets. What a waste. People are not bringing their life belongings, right? <laughs> so just bring, uh, uh, um, save that space. You don't need huge bedrooms. They're basically gonna sleep in the bedroom as long as they have their big bed. A nice bathroom, yeah, a nice bathroom with good finishing, splurge a little bit on the bathroom. That's, not, that's an attention grabber. Bathrooms, kitchen. Kitchen doesn't have to be huge, but make it nice. You know, as you speak to me, and, and I think, because I do a lot of marketing, I'm thinking if I had an Airbnb, I would at least have one feature in that house that is Instagrammable. So like, meaning it, it's exceptional in something, whether it's the bathroom, whether it's the kitchen, whether it's even just a really cool TV or something, where someone that stays there is gonna keep sharing that they're staying in this house. Brilliant, a absolutely, absolutely. Have a centerpiece, call it what you want. Have something that just, my favorite word, have something that pops. Right, totally. Gotta pop. So I was really amazed in, in, in a relative, relatively modest home that we bought in North Fort Lauderdale, very close to Pinecrest, on, on one of the canals, not, let's say, not the main intercoastal, but a canal. Well, we decided to put one of these uh, games pool, ping pong, hockey. Right. I can't tell you how many people reserve just because of that. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> That's what I'm, you know, when I say return on investment. So don't look at the fact that, that thing cost you $2,000, but what kind of reservations is it bringing in? I think sometimes as um, business owners, we don't think like a client. We think as a business owner, right? Yeah. We, we forget that they're there with friends or family having fun. What would they like to do? What would they like to, in, like, just exactly. like how you mentioned that. Right. That sounds like a fun trip, right? Yeah. Compared to thinking, oh, should I spend this extra for whoever stays there? I think it's important to, 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 to divide sort of the investment or the, the opportunity. There's the urban opportunity and there's the more experiential opportunity. So the urban opportunity, we're, we're in Wynwood. And in Wynwood, you know, make it, make it playful, make it a little bit, so we have, a, we have a foosball thing. Instead of having just a regular coffee table, it's a coffee table, but it's also a foosball, right? Nice. And, and it, 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 it's nice, and we have the walls that are painted, so it goes with the area. But it's probably not the place where people are gonna spend a lot of time in that, in that apartment because they wanna hang around Wynwood. They want to go to the restaurants, they want the nightlife, they want the bars. Now, once you get into the home, you really have to begin thinking of things that people can do in their, their home. The more they bring the family, the more they're thinking experiences in the home. So I see a lot of Airbnbs, they show the space. Well, why don't you show people what they can do in the space? Right. Right? I mean, that's, a, that's one step beyond simply staging a home. Stage a home to show them how things fit in the home, but now show them what they can do in the home. 
Yeah, it's funny, and it's it's so smart about you were saying about like if you're in Wynwood. So like for those that don't know Wynwood, it's basically very artsy place, yeah. street artists and stuff like that. How cool would that be if you go to that house and you have like some street artist stuff in the house, yeah. and then you're definitely gonna Instagram that to everyone, and then you're gonna talk about your trip, and yeah, just having it meet the area. That's such a good tip yeah. that you said, because. I mean, if it was super like conservative and it's in Wynwood, it's like, yeah, it yeah. you don't want to make something stale. You, you want to make it a little risque, a little bit, um, you know, strong, colorful, make, make a statement. Uh, absolutely. And, and we're doing that more and more. There's this concept of, of thematic homes that, that, that a home has, has a story, yeah. has a personality, has a character and, and, uh, uh, and it, the, way, the direction that we're moving on is, is Airbnb is fantastic in terms of visibility. You get this, this stage where the whole world can see you and you can't possibly buy that with digital marketing or any other way. But the trick is to go beyond. The trick is to really, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we cycle up that Airbnb transaction into a long-term relationship with a guest? so that they really want to come back to you and book directly with you and, uh, and, and share, those, share those experiences. Totally, and I, I don't know that much about like Airbnb or these short-term rentals, like what you can share. Can you do videos on there? Like when you're sharing the property to people? Oh yeah, you can do anything inside the property. You can do videos. So what don't we let people do? That, that's that's uh, uh, interesting. Well, yeah. But we, I mean like when you're marketing it. If it's on Airbnb, the site, or it's on your website or whatever. Ah, good point. On our website, we can, we can put videos. The direction that Airbnb is heading and Verbo are heading, they are heading in the direction of videos. I don't think that it's, 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 it's happened yet. There's an issue with, with space, of course. I mean, how do you manage all of these different videos? Now, we are, I did it with one property actually in Naples that I never greet the guest. I mean, in this business, you don't really, today, you don't really greet the guest. It, it's too expensive. Right, right, right. Some right. people might even find it intrusive. It's totally. no longer part of the culture. And guests don't even go to an agency to pick up a key. That was the old days. Right, right. 20 years ago, they would go to this agency in North Carolina, Outer Banks, the keys to this home. <laughs> and, yeah. But um, so now everything is electronic, makes it safer. Every guest has a unique code. Technology is really right. important. People underestimate technology is key in, in, in our industry. So, um, so you, you, um, you, make it, you, make it, you make it accessible, you know? Yeah, so the reason I brought up the video, again, thinking with my marketing hat on, if I have a, a short-term rental yeah. and I want to rent it out, I'm probably going to do a video sharing the experiences like you, you, like you mentioned yeah. and maybe surrounding areas, whatever, just a, a quick video. Yeah, I, I lost my train of thought. That's where I was headed. In my property in Naples, and that's the only one I did it in, I did a video because we never greeted the guest. So I went with somebody who works with me, with my right-hand person, and, and she was nice enough to come with me to the house, and I said, you know, do me a favor, uh, hold the camera and, and film me. And, right. and I basically pretended I was the host and I said, hello, Mr. Guest, I'm sorry I can't be here in person, but this is the best substitute that I can do. Let me show you the home. Let me show you the key things, what I love about this home. And it was, I don't know how long it was, it was maybe two to four minute video where I covered a key orientation about the house, things that they would like to access, and I also covered things that I thought were important for safety. That's really smart because I think like if some if I'm going to uh, a place that I've never been to, every house has its quirks, whether it's a condo or a house. Yes. And I go there, and before I even start um, like looking at it, exploring everything, and I see a little short video, it tells me, "Hey, with the refrigerator, do this instead of that," yeah. and it it just shows that you care so much, right? Exactly, and and with videos, you're connecting. It's a different medium to connect with guests. So some people really like to read and they will read every word and they will read every caption. But some people will read the headlines. Yet on the other hand, they could be very comfortable with a 90 second, two or three minute video. So right. you want to have as many touch points as possible. And that is a key focus for us this year to see how we can make a video of every single one, at least 
of our high-end properties to begin with, every single one of them. Because I think in the end, it will create a better guest experience, but you know what? They're gonna be calling us a lot less. Right. They're not going to be calling at one in the morning. Oh, where's the remote to the TV? <laughs> I mean, that's like what Apple does. They create a problem that you don't know that you have and they have a solution for it. And then, you know, you, you need, you want that product. In this case, you create, you share the problem that they may experience. And then, like you said, they're not gonna, they're gonna feel a lot more comfortable if something happens. They're like, oh, I got the answer to that. And everyone wants to show how smart they are to the other people, you know? I got this, you know? Um, as, far as, as far as the property, so we're talking about like this, the, this home with as many bedrooms as we can, mm -hmm. um, the bathrooms, if possible, en suite. If not, the bathrooms are matter a bit less. Right. So, about what square footage would it be? I know it varies, yeah. but. I would say a really good size begins, and it varies by market, but a really good size in an urban market in terms of a home is probably 2,000. 2,000 square feet, you can squeeze in four bedrooms, small, but four bedrooms, maybe a bigger master bedroom, um, and two to three bathrooms. So 2,000 on up. Okay, so with this home that we have four bedrooms, mm -hmm. maybe two or three baths or plus more, whatever, whatever we can fit in, what furniture would you buy for this place? I would buy, well, as we, we went over the beds already. Right. Um, I prefer big beds as opposed to twin beds for the kids. Okay. I, it's, it's, of course, I love having kids and family, but the reality is the money is with adults. Right, right. Totally. <laughs> and, and you want to fill your rooms with adults because the more adults, the more paying people. Right, right. Totally. Right? The kids don't pay. Right. So I made that mistake when I started in the industry. I had a house in Victoria Park and I put, I said, well, you've got the parents and the kids in the other room. And I think I could have done a lot better. So I put two twins in the other room. But I think that kicked me out of the market of a lot of two couple situations. Right, right. Or, or just even a second person staying in the second room. Not even a couple, but maybe the mother or the father. So um, if I were to choose now, uh, unless I have many, many rooms, I would really go with big beds in the room. Now, if the room is big enough, yeah, you can have two fulls or two queens, but, um, but I would go with I would go with bigger beds instead of instead of twins, e even even for kids. Okay. And what other furniture would you recommend? Uh, always good to have a nice little night table. I place a lot of emphasis, and that that's me. Maybe I I spent a lot of time in Europe, where I always noticed it uh, compared to the States. I pay a lot of attention to lighting, lighting, uh, lighting sets the mood. So I like being conscious of of yellow versus white. Which is better? Uh, yellow is, is better, but you don't want it, you know, too dim. Uh, the best is choice. So you want to give guests the ability to switch from one to the other. So you may want to have the house lit with yellow light that is warm. And, and, but, you know, you go into hotels and, and I, I just came from Chicago. I, I was at the Hilton, downtown Hilton, and, and the lighting was terrible. And it's that way in almost every hotel. It's just not... When you say it doesn't terrible. seem to be attention to design of the light. Not enough light. Okay, so yeah. not, not bright enough. And, and no choice. So if you can give people dimmers and give them that choice with the yellow and, and, uh, and white. Now I have one, one, one apartment, which was mine, where I experimented more with light. And, and what I did then is I actually, in a niche in the living room, I, I had this remote control and I gave them the ability to create like colored light. Right, Mood, right. Just the LEDs, yeah. Yeah. So I think anything that sets the ambience is important. Little night tables, they don't have to be huge night tables, especially if you're already taking a lot of real estate with the room, just put in very small night tables. You always want a little, sort of a little bench at the end of the bed so they can put something, maybe, maybe a chair. You don't want to have too much furniture again here. You don't want to have too much furniture. You have to really cut that balance. As you said before, also in furniture, you may ha want to have one piece that's very, very nice. TVs. I'm not a TV guy, but I, I, I came to quickly understand this business. You need many and big TVs. Okay, and then with the TV, what about like a device for it? Apple TV or something like that? Is that yes, necessary? Yes, absolutely. So nowadays, we, we've, 
we went away from cable a long time ago. First of all, it's an, an extra expense that's not important. And now there's fewer and fewer people that will say, oh, I need my cable. Yeah. At the beginning, we did have a few of those. But you want, we go with basically Roku, a okay. Roku type of device. And people bring in their Netflix accounts. Right. So really important. And I, and I know Airbnb now is also emphasizing this in a major way. If you want to capture that nomad, if you want to capture that high earner, digital uh, traveler, you want fast internet. So don't save a single penny on internet. Get the fastest you can get and even make it. I, I sometimes even put it on the title of the property, the speed. Right, that makes sense because that would be something I'd be interested in, you know? If you have a garage, an EV charger. Nice. Absolutely, not that expensive, but that will, it, it, this, you know, the beauty for somebody coming in, this market is extremely fragmented. There's a few huge players, but they're so huge, they're so institutional, and they're so disconnected from the owner and from the guest. And they're connected to their Wall Street money. <laughs> right, right. Private equity and, 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 you know, give me houses to management. They're marketing machines. Right, right. So then there's everybody else and everybody else doing things in many different ways. So, so you, can, uh, you can really personalize the business and, and put your own touch on it. So tell me a bit about your company. Sure. We started early in this process. I started first as a, started as a, I started as a traveler on Airbnb. I had a money management business. I became independent, left the big bank and looked for alternative ways to travel. Found Airbnb in 2012 and decided to experiment and see, let me see what this is like. I fell in love with it right away because I felt like it transported me back to when I was 21 years old, traveling with a, <laughs> with a, with a knapsack and, and going to my, to my uh, parents' friend's place in Italy and that place and, you know, or just staying in youth hostels, right? Just and adventurous, right? Adventure and, and really, really absorbing the culture of each place. And I thought, wow, it's a pity you just can't keep doing that all your life. So this concept comes around and I realized, wow, this is like going back to those days of, of being a local, going to different places, getting to know. And, and frequently, I only rented rooms in places because I felt that by renting rooms, I would really connect with a local. And quick story, I did that in Cape Cod and I had a conference, but I also love kiteboarding. So I, um, I went to my host and I said, you wouldn't happen to know somebody that kiteboards. He said, well, my brother does. And I went kiteboarding with her brother. Those are the special moments and opportunities that happened. So fast forward a few years later, I decided this is a business model. And uh, I stayed in a brownstone in New York and the guy who rented from me had rented four brownstones in the same building. So by day, he worked in computers at Columbia University and by night he would come and clean and, oh, wow. and do all this. <laughs> and he was making more money with that business than he was at Columbia University. So that's wow. when I said, wow, this, this is interesting. It's early on. And I shocked my, uh, my assistant when I told her, well, we're going to start doing an Airbnb business. And this was in 2014. So uh, we started there and, and I did something different that from the beginning, I decided I didn't want my business to be a mom and pop. I didn't want it to be a single unit business. I wanted it to, to scale. I wanted it to grow. I wanted it to be interesting. And uh, I wanted it maybe to be in different locations. So it was a different business. And that for that, I needed people and I needed information. So I, I buy industry software to manage the operations, the reservations. Uh, we have our own sort of area. We have our own platform where we book direct. We have to go through Airbnb. And, um, and uh, we, we started, started with four or five, mainly friends and friends giving us properties. And uh, little by little, it just started to get bigger. But what, what was really important, what people have to decide is what direction do you want to go? Do you want simple? Do you want to just have a little bit of extra income? Or do you want to really create a business that becomes your job and your livelihood and your investment? And they're two very different angles. See, one thing is to manage your own Airbnb. The other thing is to manage other people's Airbnb. It's like your money versus other people's right. money. It's a whole other ball game. There's a fiduciary responsibility. There's funds that are coming together. How do you manage all that? 
And uh, both models are good. Both work really well. So I would say decide if you want, if you want just to dip your feet into it and do something that's fun. But also, too many people are focused on the money and the business. You can't forget that this is really hospitality. And it's a business of, of the heart and you have to really be in it. You have to like hospitality and, and like helping people. Um, because if not, it, it, it's, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna be fun, and ultimately it will not be, it will not be profitable.